Viewers, good afternoon or good day, wherever you are. I am Professor Norman Dundon, Vice Principal Academic at the University of Pretoria. It is my signal pleasure to welcome you to this, the University of Pretoria's first international virtual film premiere. I wish to extend a special welcome to everyone from the USA and Denmark who joined today, thanks to our partners at the Critical African Studies Project and Doc Lounge Arrows. At the outset, I wish to acknowledge our deep um, gratitude um, and indebtedness to the Reverend Dr. Llewellyn McMaster and Ms. Jelena Zimri of the Bellar Congregation of the Uniting Reformed Church in Southern Africa for their key role in the realization of this film project. Some two years ago, Ms. Zimri approached Professor Sheena O'Connell with the idea for this project and together with Dr. McMaster and the Essa Gestichts Council and Congregants arranged for Professor O'Connell to take the filming project. Research on this film started in April 2018 at the time when Professor O'Connell was deeply involved in another project at the Slave Church in Long Street, Cape Town. The Unhotsnam film project was personally significant uh, for Professor O'Connell and she and her UP team undertook extensive archival research and over a period of time met with various congregants to gather the threads of the complex history of a congregation, of a church, of churches, of glimpses of the future, all threads that were to be intricately woven together to result in this film. In essence, the film in Godsnaam is about the history of slavery, colonialism and racism in South Africa it is about the origins and consequences of apartheid and about the link between this reprehensible ideology and the hierarchy in Gekerk. At its core, the film also engages the legacies of two churches whose division continues to separate people. The film, in God's name, asks difficult and profoundly unsettling questions. Indeed, at various points the film, you will agree, makes for fairly harrowing viewing. However, it is a complex form, so it is also a form about hope, compassion, communion, and future possibilities. And God's Nam invokes us to acknowledge South Africa's painful past. Importantly, however, it also urges us to acknowledge the brave and enduring struggles of many South Africans committed to social justice. Here now is the 20 minute long form in God's Nam. Ik kon daar jaren geleden in 1994, wat ons bij trots in de ingeert noemde die senoren van verzoening, heeft die president Nelson Mandela de Afrikaans die senoren toegesproken van de GC. Hij is zo blij om te vernemen dat die ingeert bezig is om afscheid te nemen van apartheid, maar die groeien toets, die lakmoed toets, is als die ingeert weer heel wordt. Daar die dag zal ons weer dat apartheid rechtig weg is in die ingeert. En dat is nog niet weg. The history of the church is a peculiar lens through which one can read the language of slavery, colonization into apartheid. So I think everyone would agree that the church came together with the colonial project. Uh, you have an interesting example of the small church in the south coast that came with the Portuguese, but actually with the Dutch colonial regime, and it spread from there through various mission projects. It was also a specific form of the Christian Godsdienst, namely the reformed Godsdienst. Tot met 1857 was daar gezamenlijk aan bidden. Mensen van alle rassen, alle kleren, alle talen was in diezelfde gemeentes. Vrienden, goedemorgen. Dit is uh, lekker om allemaal hier te zien vanmorgen. Misschien moet ik daar niet zo met de vette van opsteek van de hand zien wie ze allemaal bezoekers hier bij ons mogen. Is hier iemand in het buitenland misschien? Is hier dat mensen in het buitenland? Nee, dat met allemaal is maar hier in onze omgeving. Bij wel, maar mag dit voor ons allemaal vanmorgen uh, ontmoeten met die drie keer dat God wees. You can just imagine if you are in the same church 
and you are there with your slaves. That kind of contradiction is not sustainable. During the week, you dehumanize these people, you exploit them for all their worth, and that man are sitting with you, praying to the same God, sharing the same bread, the same wine. That's not sustainable. Even for a slave owner with just a little bit of conscience, that has to be unbearable. And daar kom a ring, the ring from Stockholmstrom. And the question is, can we not only have a good job for the brain men? I know that we are the visitors of the end and far of the day. Can we not only be the visitors? Okay, from where? Great Cat, that's here in the camp, right? Is it a scam, Dr. Boesak? Very, very heartily welcome. Aan u allemaal. By ons danksegingsdienst. Nou, dis nie een gewone dienst nie. Dit is een dienst waar tijdens ons dankie sê vir jyre vir reisgenade. The debate on segregation was actually raging for a number of decades before 1857 with a part of the church saying quite specifically that they want separate Eucharist services. So Holy Communion should be at separate tables in separate services. En toe neem die kerk die hartseer besluit dat hulle sê al behoorde tot die kern van die evangelie dat allemaal saam in die nachtmaaltafel moet sit terwille van die swakheid van sommige broeders vir een beperkte tyd die aparte nachtmaaldienst te gehou kan word. Hulle het gedink dat gaan my net so kort intermereling wees en binnenkort sal alles weer recht wees maar dit was nie so nie, dit was die dun end van die wig they had Long Street where all the slaves went. Is a gestig, is the slave kerk. A gestig kom van christelike oefenskool, want dit was nie eers bedoel om a kerk te wees, nie net a oefenskool vir slave, maar dit vir ons is waar dit alles begin. Die Heere het hierdie gemeente uitgeleid, deurgeleid, van slavernij na vryheid geleid. U weet ons sê van Langstraat, tot Watsonia. So ons het so baie om voor dankbaar te wees. Nou in ons traditie, sing ons ons besoekers, a hartelike welkom toe. Later het die Inge Kerk in Afrika gevolg, wat die kerk vir swart mense was, en in 1963 die Reform Church in Afrika, wat die Inge Kerk vir Indier mense was. Ek was gebore in 1925, terwijl my pa en my ma hier op rustheid was in Suid-Afrika. Hulle is terug na die sendingveld en ek het achtergebleid by my oom en tante toe ek 13 maanden oud was. Ek het groot geword, het van kleins af een ideaal gekoester om ook vir die heren te werk. En in die jaar 1944, in paasfeest, word daartoe sendingconferentie gehou in Stelmbos met die thema van wat is die verhouding van die christen student tegen oor die nie blanke mense. At that stage, the apartheid policy did not exist. Ons het gesê, die Heerse woord sê nie, ons hoort by mekaar. Maar daar was ander mense gewees, ook in die theologische wereld, wat gesê het, maar die Bijbel sê ons moet verscheidenheid aan taf. Die eerste groot theologische argument is door professor E.P. Groenewald op die tafel gesit in 1947. Toe hy gesê het, daar moet afzonderlijke ontwikkeling en afzonderlijke kerke vir verskillende groepe wees. En dan kom daar twee belangrike goed by. Die eerste volgende ene is die romantiek, en dit het niks met liefde te doen nie. Dit gaan oor een ophemeling van jou eie, een waardering van jou eie. En die beste voorbeeld wat jy daarvan kan kry, kreem is uit Nazi Duitsland. Daarmee saam nationalisme die volk en alles waaraan hy saamgaan. En dit het aanleiding gegeet tot die vestiging van een apartheidstheologie. 
Het is baie interessant hoe die mense die Bijbel gebruik het om apartheid te rechtvaardig. Een van die teksten waarvoor hulle baie lief was, is onder andere Deuteronomium 23 vers 2. In die oude Afrikaanse vertaling staan daar, dat geen baster mag in die vergadering van die Heere kom nie. En hierdie vers dan is dikwels rondgegooi in synode sale en landsbraai vleisvere om apartheid te rechtvaardig. Wanneer een mens echter kyk na die Hebreeus, dan sien jy dat dit eindelijk een baie swak vertaling is. Tower of Babel, for example. It was said that God punished the, the will of the people to be united by scattering them and, and confusing their languages. So the will of God is separateness. The will of God is not unity. The will of God is that people should speak separate languages and be separate and spread across the world. But then that little word race was, was sort of slipped in. Then we had the election and the National Party won with the apartheid program. At that time, there was no deviating from that because that was the party's policy. And they won the election by about three constituencies, I think. Very, 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 very tenuous, the whole situation. Nou ja, 1948, ek is na Weinberg toe. As een hulppredikant by onze sending gemeente. En daar het ek voor die Heere tot die besef gekom, maar hierdie mense is my mense, is ons mense. Ons moet ons mense by mekaar kry. Nou ja, ek was in die begin maar huiverig, voetje vir voetje geloop, maar ook al hoe meer het ek besef, maar ek het geen ander kese nie. Ek moet hierdie boodskap van die evangelie, moet ek hand af. David Botha explained for the first time how the mission policy that was conceived of in 1857 evolved and became the basis and the foundation of the political policy we called apartheid in 1948. That's why the Kerkbode, that's the official organ of the White Dutch Reformed Church, in September of 1948 had an editorial after the victory of the National Party at the polls and it proclaimed apartheid is a church policy. Just like that. And without it, the National Party would never, ever, ever have come to power. You couldn't expect, say, a movement like the African National Congress to understand what the moral justification and biblical justification was and how crucial it was for Afrikaans-speaking Christians to have that. We could, and one way in which we had to fight that was to expose it, of course, as the heresy that it was, but also then to work practically towards unity to show that this can actually be done. There is a history. When the first Europeans came to these shores, they did not come to an unencumbered land. Niemand's land, Hitler Tuche said. That's not true. They met a people here, your ancestors. It doesn't matter how much they lie in history books. You know in your heart what happened. My kinder daar is nie so wonderlik he. So ek wil nie daar oor gesel, so ons gaat aan. Ek was baie betrokken daar in Langstraat. Ek het sondagskoel gehou, langdachtersbond behoort. Ek het aan die CGV behoort. Dominee Jordaan was een wonderlijke mens nie. Die een wat na hom gekom het, was, bykie, was baie blank. Hy kreeg vir jou in die winkels, dan maak hy asof hy jou nie ken nie. Die zondag sê, dominee, ek wil net vir jou sê, as jy my weer in die dorp krijg, dan moet jy net morgen sê, jy hoef jy my, ga my net morgen sê. Moet nie maak of jy my nie ken nie. Die uitgesit in die kaap was so skierlik, en het was een hartseer story. Jy kan nie meer tussen die blankes woon nie. Uit, my jong. The sound scenario was very few people of the actual congregations lived in Cape Town. 
We all, most of our people, we had to move. So the majority of the people lived outside of Cape Town, which means traveling by bus, by train, in order to get to the service in the morning. 1975, the church had to come to a point where they had to decide to sell the building because there wasn't enough funds to actually rebuild or revamp the church. We rented the St. Stephen's Church. We, we had services together. Other times we would have services alone. It was a good relationship until this building, this ground. To Merald came from St. Stephen's in town and he became the minister of Esa Hustig, the current congregation. We were at the church offices next door until the doors of this building were open to us. Hierdie gebouw waar in ons vandag sit, het baie groot historische gebeurtenisse plaasgevind. Ons predikante het baie goed gebruik gemaakt van die preekstoel op die stadium, te vertel van die verdrukking wat plaasvind. Juli in 1976, toe IWK-studenten ook in respons op wat in so het toe gebeur het, opgestaan het, politieke ontwaking in my eie leven, Sederdien het ek maar redelijk politiek en geloof godsdienst gemeng en geïntegreerd in my leven. Die pastorie was die meest geskikte plek waar ons studenten van al en ons jongkinders skeiling gesoek het. More than a thousand people were arrested yesterday. We have said that we will show this government and the world that four years of a state of emergency and four years of the most unbelievable brutality, four years of all of that could not break the back of the democratic movement and neither could it break the spirit of our people. Een baie belangrike vergadering van die Wereldbond van Gereformeerde Kerke het in 1982 in Ottawa in Canada plaasgevind. En by die vergadering was al die gereformeerde kerke oor die wereld saamgetrek. Of die vergadering het begin met die nachtmaalsdienst. En by die nachtmaalsdienst het die afgevaardigdes van die Engesending kerk, die Bruin kerk, en die Engekerk in Afrika opgestaan en uitgestap. Want het hulle gesê, as ons nie in Suid-Afrika saam met ons witbroers en sisters van die Engekerk aan die nachtmaalstafel kan sit nie, gaan ons het ook nie hier doen. Maar jy kan vir jouself indink op een wereldtoneel wat sy geweldige reaksie dit tot gevolg gehad het. Hulle het die oomlik van waarheid verklaar en hulle het apartheid as ketterij verklaar. Toe het hulle volgende ding gedoen, hulle gesê, maar as ons dit sê, dan moet die mense wat by hierdie vergadering is, wat apartheid ondersteun, uit die vergadering uitgaan, want hulle is dan ketters. En die afgevaardigd is by die Belaarse node, sê, as ons ernstig is, dan vraag dit vir een beleidnis. All across the world, people know of the place called Bela because of the confession of Bela. We all have to commit ourselves to stand where God stands. That's a phrase from Article 4, which is that God is in a special sense the God of the poor and the excluded and the marginalized. That's where God stands in history. And that our unity and our reconciliation is so that together we will stand there. That's what the Bela confession is about. And Christus is ons meer as wat daar gesê het ons is. In Christus is ons vry. En ons klein meer die vryheid. Ons gaan nie meer wacht dat dit aan ons gegee word nie. Ons klein dit, ons eis dit op in die naam van God. So the Belhaar Beleidnis was accepted and signed in this building here in Belhaar is Agestig. That was in 1996. So genaamde dochterkerke net besluit het, hier trek ons nou die lijn. Ons gaan nie wacht vir een moeder om te reageer nie. Want dit is precies die context waar binnen Belha beleidnis ontstaan het en die VGK ontstaan het twee jonger kerke wat besluit het, ons moet vir God meer gehoorzaam wees as mense. En die NG kerkfamilie sien ons dan nou uitstaande as die NG kerk wat die wit 
gedeelte van die familie is. Um, en daarom, wanneer ons kyk na onze logo, sal jy sien, die cirkel is hier voltooi nie, en dis ook om ruim te laat, so die cirkel voltooi kan word. The Dutch Reformed Church has always stated that the Ballard Confession is indeed theologically sound. But the Dutch Reformed Church has not thus far been able to or willing to take the step to really embrace it as a confession of faith. The dilemma is that the VGK and the Ballard Confession is is ononderhandelbaar. And a great part of the Lidmaten of the Inge Kerk is that we can't get as a En as daai inpasse en die op 'n manier uit die padheid gaan kom nie, gaan dit 'n groot krisis op die pad van kerk her enigin bly. Dis tragies as 'n ouer fonds in sameling in 'n gemeente hou. En uh, mense skryf nog op 'n pakkie. Hierdie klere is slegs vir wit mense. Maar dit gebeur. En die vraag is hoe kom gebeur dit? Where do Afrikaners feel at home where they can really just be themselves without having to look over their shoulders and feel uncomfortable? And sadly the church, maybe the Afrikaans media, are sort of these spaces where, where this identity, this, this, this sort of ethnic identity, can, can be expressed in a comfortable way. And I think the dilemma of our is that the lidmaten geconfronteerd word met the harde werkelijkheid van the alledaagse bestaan. Van BEE, van maatschappijen wat toemaak, van kinders wat nie kering kry nie, van ouwens wat nie gekies word vir sportspanne nie, wat hulle op een slechte politieke plek plaas. They think that if we are one church, we'll have to worship in English, or in Isisulu, or in Susutu. So there's a fear of losing an, an ethnic identity. In the last few years, since 1994, church growth in this country has been marked by the remarkable growth of what we call fundamentalist, new Pentecostalist churches. If you look at the Dutch Reformed Church, they have lost in 2010 and 11 over 10,000 people to these churches. If those young people leave the white Dutch Reformed Church, they come into Pentecostal churches where race doesn't matter anymore. They speak English. There's no Afrikaans to be heard. All of that precious white Afrikaner culture is out the window. What unites them are the ideologies below the theology, women in their place against LGBTQI people, uh, wealth as a, an idol. And then all of a sudden, all of the arguments that they throw up against unification with the black reformed churches, and in some cases where the language and the style of worship is still the same, that flies out the window. So what's, what's left? It's not so much the word no the argument over geld, wanneer daar gepraat wordt, over die uh, over inwording nie. Maar ek het al niet gewonder of dit niet ook toch rol speel nie in die gesprekke, of dit niet ook misschien die olifant in die vertrek is waar oor mense nie praat nie. Maybe in the black congregations there's also a growing sense of, do we really want to be with the whites over everything that has happened? Can people really change? There's a lack of faith that this unity can really work. And this is always called the Groot Kerk in uh, Pretoria. The cabinet during apartheid apparently had prayer meetings here in the church. We used to fill this building with young white Christians. The congregation started going smaller and smaller and smaller and by 1994, 95, it was just a small service on a Sunday morning. And so the, this Melodia Tswane congregation was looking for a place of worship in Pretoria. And the, the church council then, they said, you can come and use our building. In fact, we'll sell you a 50% share of the building for whatever you've got. It's also a refugee-friendly and a migrant-friendly building, which actually is amazing that that church council of the Dutch Reformed Church at the time had the vision to to just open their arms and to embrace whoever didn't have a building uh, in, in the name of Christ. Gelukkig is dit so dat in die gesprekke in die of van die verskillende moderatiere, die leiers van die verskillende kerke, daar die moontlikheid geskep is in die kerkorde dat as gemeentes of selfs herring of synodes so lang vol by mekaar kom dan kan dit. En hier en daar gebeur dit. A 
apartheid is een loning van die versoeningsdaad van Jezus Christus. Maar uiteindelijk het die Heer voor ons op een wonderlijke wijze bevestig dat als jij mij kent, dan is je waar je moet wees. En als je naaste mij kent, dan is hij of zij waar zij moet wees. En dat hoort ons aan elkaar. Dat is niet zo dat we zo'n mens wat minder waardig is. Nie. As a church, we must never forget that this is God's church. And when the Holy Spirit is at work, we as human beings cannot stop it. Sometimes we try to stop the Holy Spirit. Daar is die wat het lijkt asof ons, soos ons in die ooskap sê, tjona, wanneer ons bykie sink. Maar de seasons, die kerk van die Heere sal voortgaan. Die kerk van die Heere sal altyd voortgaan. You gave us the gift of the Bella Confession. In ons gemeente, die grote kerk, de paar jaar gelede, oorweldigend gestem om Bella te aanvaar as beleidings. So Bella speaks so strongly and clearly of unity. We remember throughout our history how the vice of the communion table could be. We therefore would like to respond to this very kind and humbling invitation towards us to come and sit at the table of the Lord with you by giving something symbolic. Ons het besluit om een nachtmaalbeker te bring waar waar op gegrafeer is een beker, een lichaam. Ons erken die geschiedenis, ons erken dat die Bijbel, die nachtmaalstafel gebruik is om mensen uit elkaar uit te jaag. So ons uitnodiging ook naar die grote kerk is als ons twee kerken kan dalk iets begin waar onze genootschappen nou sukkel om in te worden. Als ons rondom die tafel waar alles begint een boodschap uitsteer, en Christus is dat moeilijk. We need to be reminded of what the true gospel of Christ is about. It's about humanity, it's about sharing a country. To try to, to just reverse and undo so much of the harm that has been done also in the name of Christ in this country in the past. If you are serious about unification, you have to create those moments where black and white people can come together in worship. It doesn't happen automatically because we've wasted 25 years. And so much has happened. And there's been a hardening. So racism is more prevalent. So is homophobia. So is xenophobia. I don't think it's too late. I don't think it's too late. But we have made it so much harder for ourselves. Belha, die gemeente, Belha, die beleidings, is die krachtige uitdaging aan die kerk in die eerste plek, maar ook die krachtige getuienis in een tijd van wanhoop en hopeloosheid, dat ons dier Belha en met Belha weer wil hoop gee. Viewers, I'm sure that light me you that that is very powerful, very moving. Now today we have a panel of five speakers who will respond to the film. The panelists are joining us from Pretoria and the Esa Church in Belhar, Cape Town. Viewers, listeners, I ask you to please join welcoming firstly the Reverend Dr. Llewellyn McMaster, um, the moderator of the Cape Regional Synod of the United Reform Church, the Uniting Reform Church in Southern Africa, and Minister of the Bella Congregation of the Esa Gestig. Secondly, Professor Henny Stander, former Deputy Dean of Humanities at the University of Pretoria, and Emeritus Minister of the Dutch Reformed Church. Thirdly, we have with us Ms. Jolina Zimri of the Bella Congregation of the Uniting Reform Church in Southern Africa. And then we have Duemne Rian de Villiers, of the Dutch Reformed Church's Groote Kerk 
in Cape Town. And last but not least, we have the Falls Director and Producer, Professor Sheena O'Connell of the University of Pretoria with us. Dr. McMaster, if I could turn to you first, could you bring us what impact has this failure to unify the two churches had on the uniting Reformed Church in Southern Africa? Thank you, uh, Professor Norman Duncan. I think uh, perhaps a very easy answer would be no significant impact. We are just fine. And we can continue to be fine for some time, given the history of the two churches. But on the other hand, I think it's a bit more complex. And it also depends on what lens or lenses you put on when you have to answer the question. But what I know, not just for the Uniting Reform Church, but for the two churches, I personally think we have missed an opportunity to be a powerful witness in this country, to be a testimony of the power of the gospel of Jesus Christ, a witness that our oneness in Christ was more powerful than our separateness under apartheid. We've missed an opportunity to say to the world and to the rest of the church that Christ can heal wounds caused by human systems of oppression and social engineering. So that for me is where I think it's part Urksa is part of the church, and that is the impact, maybe a negative impact, on our testimony as a church. I think what is true is that apartheid has been a very powerful system. We found that out in our lives, even within our church, the Uniting Reform Church, as we struggle to really experience full unity, we realize we have been so captured, in a sense, by apartheid, that we can't think in a different way about ourselves and about our sisters and brothers. So it is clear that the social and political identities that apartheid has imprinted on us, for me, seems to be more powerful and important to us than our shared identity in Jesus Christ. And I think that, for me, is a result also, that we're still struggling with it because we are failing as two churches to unite. Mm. I don't know if I must stop there or my, shall I finish my, <laughs> my full answer, Prof? You can continue, uh, Dr. McPasa. Thank you. I think it's, it's significant. Uh, yesterday was 34 years ago that the Belha Confession was adopted in this church. And if we read the confession, it is very clear that the formulation with regard to unity in Article 2 is what still inspire, drive, and motivate us not to give up. Well, our confession says, we believe that unity is therefore both a gift and an obligation for the church of Jesus Christ. That through the working of God's spirit, it is a binding force, yet simultaneously a reality, which must be earnestly pursued and sought one which the people of God must continually build, be built up to attain, according to Ephesians 4. So although the two churches have committed themselves to unification, it seems that it is an elusive unity or unification. And by the way, I must put it on record that I am still uncomfortable with the notion of reunification, if reunification means 
that the name Dutch Reformed Church will also be part of a, un, a, a unified church. I have big problems with that. I think our um, calling ourselves Uniting Reformed Church was the first step in creating a new church in South Africa mm. without the baggage of the past, which is also in the name itself. So what we see then is that on the question, are we closer uh, now? I don't think so. Because if I look just at the recent history of how the two churches has come together at Esland Park in 2006, a year later in Achterberg 2007, there was great enthusiasm that the churches will unite. It's going to happen soon. But here we sit today. And the only thing that we have now between the churches is the so-called provisional church order. And these two churches, URC, Urksa, and, and Dutch Reformed Church, have committed themselves through the adoption of, of the uh, provisional church order to continue the search for unity. That's why the two of them say together, church unity is a matter of conviction and leadership of prayer and discernment, of values and pouring out yourself way beyond whatever you could imagine. But it's also a matter of true discipleship, obedience, fulfillment, and of being authentic to the gospel so that the world may believe. That is the echo of the word of God, the echo of the confession of Belha, so that the world may believe. Now, what have we up to now? On record, there's the uh, Urksa Melodi Yatswane that uh, Professor Kritchener uh, referred to in, 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 um, in, in, in the documentary that united with the Dutch Reformed Church, Pretoria. There's Urksa Bredaasdorp and the Dutch Reformed Church, Bredaasdorp, that have united according or along the guidelines of the provisional order. I am invited next month to Tos River, where those two congregations also want to become one. Beside that, all we have are a couple of presbyteries that work together. But the problems and the challenges that they experience to operate in within two separate churches, but together, is more frustrating than, than working together. Uh, walking uh, uh, together. I, I think I want to end off by saying that for me, there are maybe four reasons why we struggle at the moment. I think there's a general sense of so-called what I want to call re-racialization in South Africa, political polarization taking place, coupled with the emergence of, emergence of so-called identity politics across the globe. That has an impact on the churches and how Christians feel about it. You can't get away from that. Whether it is um, colored people standing up, whether it is uh, whoever claiming their, their identity, at the moment it is complicated, uh, complicating the situation so much that there seems to be no progress. Secondly, many congregations are struggling to survive on a local level and that absorbs much of the energy in congregations. There's no time to still engage in, 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 in unity talks. Thirdly, the legacy of apartheid. Apartheid's spatial and env environmental design continues to keep communities segregated hmm. along racial and economic lines. You can't take that away. Here we are on the Cape Flats. Where's the closest Dutch Reformed Church? Hmm. And so forth. And lastly, the frustration, and I've mentioned that, experience in cases of united congregations and presbyteries because they still operate within two separate churches with different church orders resulting in hampering decision-making and restric restricting real unity between them. A case in point is Bertazdo. When I visited the Dutch Reformed Church Western Cape Synod last year in, in Gaudini, Gaudini there was frustration because the Urksa part of the United Church in Berdasdorp thought they would have full sitting 
in the synod, only to find that they can only be observers. And I think that is the frustration that people experience. What does it mean if we say we're united and we still have to adhere to different church orders? I think I, I'll, I'll stop there, Prof. Thank you. Thank you very much, Dr. McMaster, for those uh, provoking uh, reflections. Prof. Stando, if I could turn to you next. What, Prof. Stando, do you think is the current status of the unification debate in the NGA Kerk? Uh, thank you for the question, Professor Duncan. I, first of all, want to say that I fully agree with what Dr. McMaster said. Um, I also have to make it clear that I cannot speak on behalf of the Dutch Reformed Church since I do not have a leadership position in the church. But I will share with you what my perceptions are as a member of the church. I am sad to say that I do not think there is much progress regarding unification. And uh, it also seems to me that because of other issues in the church, such as the LGBT debate, the unification issue is currently on the back burner. How can we expect politicians to unite our people if the church, who has legitimatized apartheid the theologically, has not been able to be transformed in the 25 years since we have become a democratic country. But uh, Professor Duncan, what can we do in the meantime? Uh, before I try to answer that question, I just want to say that there are, of course, positive stories of hope and of changes in a few individual congregations as well, where local black, white, and brown, brown congregations come together and unite. We had a few references to these uh, congregations already uh, this afternoon. But this happens, and it can only happen, in local congregations where the leadership has a vision for the realization of Jesus' prayer, namely, Father, make us one. But there is much that we can do in the meantime. You know, some some of the changes are minor, some of the changes are major. Uh, firstly, I would say, for instance, uh, drop the word Dutch from the name Dutch Reformed Church, because that might show that, or the current name might show that we still cling to our European past. Get a name that shows that we are firmly rooted in our African soil. Align the names of of regional uh, synods to the provinces of South Africa. This may sound, if I now focus on trivial matters, while there are more important issues to address, such as famine and poverty, etc. But this is not merely a semantic game. These changes can show that we as a church embrace the new dispensation of this country. I think the mistake that many congregations make is to think that they will change when they have a diverse audience. The reality is that congregations have to implement changes in order to get a diverse audience. Take staffing as an example. The composition of the student body at our university uh, or universities in the country have changed drastically the last 30 years. Yet often the staff of a typical student congregation that serves the student community does not reflect that transformation. Often I see signboards on church grounds which are in Afrikaans only, despite the fact that the facilities are often used for nursery schools during the week which means that children and parents of all races and languages use these facilities. I often look at the websites of our congregations and then I ask myself, why would this website make it attractive for a black or brown 
a Christian to visit this congregation. Professor Duncan, we have to speed up, uh, to speed up the process of unification. But my answer is that in the meantime, local congregations, black, white and brown, can practice unity and can encourage diversity and embrace one another while theologians and synods keep themselves busy with debating these issues. Thank you. Thank you very much, Professor Stander, for those sober yet hopeful remarks. And I turn to Ms. Zimri. Ms. Zimri, um, from your perspective, what did the year-long celebrations of the 20th anniversary of the SSH reveal? Um, and I'm going to follow that up with a, a second question. Thank you, Professor. Um, good afternoon, dear esteemed guests. In God's name, our history, our future. How did we get here? Allow me to just give one step back. On the 22nd of April in 2018, our congregation returned to the Long Street Slave Church to celebrate 219 years. This was on an invitation from the museum management. And they had a surprise for us when we got there. But that service also served the purpose of preparation for the hashtag Esagestig 220 celebrations. This was a first since 1975, when the doors of Long Street were closed, supposedly forever. A gestig to become a church, now a site, a heritage site, a museum. At that service, we celebrated a few things. We celebrated, we shall overcome the Apartheid Group Areas Act, who forced the congregants out of that building and who scattered the congregants right over the peninsula. We celebrated 43 years since the closing of those doors. We also celebrated 40 years in the new building here in Balar. We celebrated God's mercy, his grace, and his love for us as his church. The surprise was the unveiling of the Road to Freedom Patna Freyheit exhibition. Taking these steps back into history became the birth of this documentary. Our history within Urksa, but also within the broader South African context. You must know where you come from to be able to determine where you're heading. So we have a history of apartheid and the Group Areas Act. We have a history of the confession of Balha, a confession which we as a church lived long before it was penned down, a biblical truth and core to being church of the triune God. Our history of the inclusion of this confession of Bala internationally, our history of democracy, our history of church unity, the merge between the Dutch Reformed Mission Church and the Dutch Reformed Church in Africa, coming in both as equals. Unification proves to be an ongoing process and journey, and we are still on high speed in that journey, building a new identity. We've been through one merge. We will survive another. Making this documentary is our legacy and also our heritage. It affirms and tells the story of our congregation's vision, and I quote, a church in community, welcoming, transformative, and Holy Spirit-led.
The documentary also caused the reinstatement, we've heard that word earlier, of the historic relationship between us as the congregation and the slave church, reclaiming our space in Long Street. Professor Duncan, over to you. Thank you very, very much, Ms. Zimri. Um, I think you've answered my second question, so I'm going to move on straight away to Duomini de Villiers. Uh, uh, Reverend de Villiers, could you perhaps tell us more about the impact this failure to unify the two churches referred to by Prof. Stunder and Dr. McMaster, what that failure has had on the, what impact it has had on the Ingeer Kerk? Uh, what is the general feeling amongst young people, older people, and the leadership of the church? Thank you, Professor Duncan, for the question. Um, good afternoon, and thank you for the opportunity. Um, also, thank you for, for the documentary. Um, I was deeply moved, and again, listening to Dr. McMaster and Dr. Busak, um, also in the documentary, I'm again once remind, again reminded of the importance of, of this process of unity. Um, in preparation for for this meeting today, I decided to reflect this past week deeply on the confession of Bellar um, and to become quiet with it. Um, and in reflecting on the question, I would like to start by saying I believe that the Dutch Reformed Church are missing out on um, on three very important processes, amongst others as well, but three very important processes that that we could receive as gifts or, or as fruits um, if we prioritize and seek as a matter of urgency a process of, of unification. First of all, I believe that we are falling short of God's plan and purpose for his church, and we are therefore missing out on the promises of healing, reconciliation, and restoration that should be the fruits of our labor and should be a united, credible testimony. Um, we don't have a credible testimony or witness um, if we don't take the unity serious. Secondly, I believe we are delaying a process of confronting our history and listening that is desperately needed to begin to understand the pain and the trauma that was inflicted on brothers and sisters by an ideology and the system, as we have clearly seen from the documentary, um, that we as Ingekerk subscribe to and promote it. And thirdly, I believe we are withholding a potential gift of unity from our country at large that is in desperate need of finding unity and building a more equal and just society. We have all the spiritual wisdom and the guidance received by Jesus himself, the Bible, our confessions, our hymns, our theological understanding and terminology, all those um, deep terminology and, and, um, and gifts to give us a, a gift of deep, lasting physical unity and reconciliation to a country that is currently desperately trying to settle for superficial unity around things like winning a Rugby World Cup. In this Heritage Week, it is also important to be reminded that our primary heritage is that we belong to one God, one God and Father, whom through his only son called us, filled us with one spirit into his one church of which he is the head. Brothers and sisters of one family, of one household, Erfgename, said the Bible, of the kingdom of God. We cannot accept that being divided as church solely on the grounds of race is our heritage. Our heritage is to restore and to fix which is what is broken. Only when we do that, we will be able to move deeper into the kingdom of God. As um, Dr. McMaster quoted from Article 2 of Bellar, I will not um, um, repeat the whole quote, but I also put it in my notes here. We believe that Christ's work of reconciliation is made manifest in the church as the community of believers who have been reconciled with God and one another. And therefore, it's a gift and an obligation. Um, and then it is clear that Bellar is calling for a spiritual and a physical unity, as well as Jesus himself in, in John 17, verse 21 to 22. Uh, professor Willy Jonker from the Dutch Reformed Church wrote, um, the late Professor Willy Jonker wrote in his book, Selfs die Kerk kan verander, in, in published in 1999, and he calls the process of unity an urgent matter. 
he says that the principal decision to unite was already taken in, in 1994. So my question is also, why have so little of this transpired in the past 21, 25 years? We should seek and be part of what God is doing and he's moving us towards unity, I believe. We shouldn't stand in his way or else he will find another way. And sadly, we are in many instances not assisting this process. We are obstructing the process. I understand um, or, or my experience on the, on the Senate floor of the Western Cape Dutch Reformed Church um, Senate um, last year was that there was these calls to make church um, unity a priority. Um, it is strongly supported on the floor. The Bella Confession is also strongly embraced overwhelmingly and in our Senate and accepted as an important confession for our time and as, and as a gift given by the Uniting, Re Uniting Reformed Church of South Africa. This morning in my service um, in the Grote Kerk, we read from Article 4 of the Bellar Confession and, and reflected on it. I'm also encouraged um, by what's happening in rural communities like Bredaastorp and um, Tausrevier and um, in, in Pretoria, where unity on the ground have become um, a reality and is beautiful and it should be applauded and imitated elsewhere. If we believe we are one, it must find expression in our being, our oneness and our togetherness. The, the Bible uses the metaphor of, of marriage for the church's relationship with, with, um, with God and, and his people. Now, in my marriage, I remember when I got married, I became one with my wife. And when I married my wife, we became one. That means we stay together. We eat together. We shared our resources together. Um, we supported each other. We forgave each other. We spoke about our differences and we found solutions for our problems. If we were to live separately, um, we would just grow apart and we will continue to misunderstand each other because we need to grow together. As NG Kerk, um, and again, listen, looking at the documentary, um, seeing the things like the Volkspiele and, and all those things that was used by nationalism, immediately I can see those things speak deep to myself because those things were, were, were given, um, um, spoken to us in school, in church, in community uh, as young children. So nationalism was deep-seated and we need to continue to fight against it, continue to reflect on it. Um, as NG Kerk, we have therefore a lot to address and, and understand, like the need to address racism, and most importantly, to understand the effect of racism. We have started doing it um, in the Western Cape Synod, as we have established a white work community of young ministers seeking to understand privilege and the effect of inequality and racism on apartheid and colonialism. I would like to con um, conclude with, a, with, a sh with just some of my own experience. In 2000, I was um, in first year at University of Stellenbosch, and that was the very first year that, um, that the Uniting Reformed Church and the NG Kerk students came together. Dr. McMaster was, um, was student dean, a, a chaplain at that time. And um, I remember how... If, um, that was my political awakening, being in that class, listening to stories um, from across the, the racial divide that was created for us, um, traveling, journeying together, um, having deeper conversations, understanding, hearing the stories of the struggle, being moved by, by it. Um, and I, I was um, taught how to read the Bible with an African lens and to move over racial boundaries. And I will always be grateful to people like Dr. Dumni Bradley Stoffels, Dumni Mark Manasse, Dumni Jacques Beekes, Dr. McMaster, Dr. Koopman, Dr. Busak, who gave me the opportunity to do this. Therefore, I would like to express my gratitude to these leaders, our forebears and peers, who have sacrificed much and adhered lots of hardship to continue to open and sometimes break down doors for the process of unity, to continue to move forward. We are indebted to them and we need to be encouraged by their fervor and service to the church and kingdom to take this baton ourselves and to see it through to completion. We have an opportunity through potential difficulty and hardship, courage and humility to continue to pass on a gift that was also passed on to us, this process of becoming one that was worked hard for, sacrificed a lot for and what our country needs most at this moment. It must be our first priority. Thank you.
Reverend de Valier, thank you very much for sharing those views and experiences. Um, viewers, finally, I would like to ask Phil's director, Professor Sheena Connell, the following question. Sheena, what inspired you to make this film and what have you learned uh, from the process? Thank you, Professor Duncan. I was inspired to make this film purely because I met a, a wonderful woman called Jelena Zimri um, at the opening of the, the exhibition at the Slave Museum some years back. And we toyed around this idea of a documentary. I didn't realize that the journey of making this film would be such a deeply personal one because during the process, I found out or I found the baptism certificate of my great grandmother uh, who was registered in the church and it started to plug all kinds of holes for me. But more importantly, this film and the business of going through to Baha has tied together my, my work around force removals, but more crucially has led me to, to, to grasp just how close the business of slavery sits at the surface of South Africa. It is not an easy history that can be whitewashed away. Um, and, and the business of these churches, I think, um, solidifies my argument. Um, I'll be 10 seconds. This film is not directed by Sheena O'Connell and that's about it. It is due to a remarkable team. And I'd like to take this opportunity of thanking everybody um, headed by Heather Thainsma and Louis and Adam and, and, and everybody, but, but also to key people in my life, such as Professor uh, Nick Shepard, who's sitting in Denmark at this moment, and Professor Anthony Bogues at Brown University, who have been pivotal in, in making me the scholar that I am. And absolutely last at least, um, a shout out to my family in Pretoria and in Canada, Thank you for joining me and thank you. Um, thank you, Professor Duncan and everybody for being part of this. Thank you, uh, Professor Connell. Thank you for your contribution to the program this often, but also thank you for this wonderful gift that you have given South Africans and the world uh, by way of this documentary. Um, as I indicated in the beginning, it is quite a striking uh, uh, um, documentary. Um, it is moving, uh, it's also troubling. Um, but it asks the questions that we have to answer um, as South Africans um, or as people interested in social justice. Now, viewers, I've come to, we, we've come to the end of the process, but before we close, of course, we have to thank people who have made uh, today a reality. In closing, therefore, I would like to thank all of you. Firstly, I would like to thank all of you who have, have joined us this afternoon or, this, or today. And here I would like to recognize also the contributions of the following people. Firstly, the Reverend Dr. Llewellyn McMaster and his congregation, Professor Henny Stander, Professor Vasu Reddy of Pretoria, Professor Mattis Kuman also of UP, Professor Corin Harris, all those who had participated and appeared in the film, the University of Pretoria's Faculty of Theology and Religion Studies, Professor Nick Shepard, the Reverend uh, de Valier, May Rasmussen of Doc Lounge, Aris, Denmark, Dr. Nadia Kamis, and Dr. Stephen S Simons. A special word of thanks also to the launch team who had worked tirelessly to bring the, this event to fruition. Thank you, Jelena Zimri, Malika Governor, Andrea Dutois, Palesa Mbonde, Louis Kluter, Dominique Niemand, Grant Atkinson, Heather Tainsma, and Adam Asmal. Viewers, we trust that the critical issues raised in this film by Sheena O'Connell will continue to be taken up by those committed to the development of a more just South African society. I thank you for your participation and I thank you for your attention.